Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, New Generation, New Expectations, Retaining Generation Z in Higher Education. I would now like to introduce Sean Hill, a senior content writer at Capture Higher Ed. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, if you have tuned into some of these um, webinars before, you know that I talk a lot about Gen Z, and this is something we've looked at for at least a year. Um, you might also know that I have a 10-year-old daughter who is definitely at the uh, tail end of Gen Z. And as I was just thinking, one of her favorite responses to me, and I'm sure you know this if you have kids that age, is, uh, quote, dot, 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 unquote. Um, so she pops up all the time in my webinars and papers and because she really is exemplary of this generation. And she's really uh, helpful and kind of teaching me stuff that I, I don't know. As a Gen Xer, which as I've said before, is typically the parents' age of Generation Z. So in some of the research that I've done recently, uh, I found this wonderful paper. And what this webinar is today is really a summation of that paper, which is a summation of a lot of other research. Um, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But what this research points to essentially is what the workforce wants out of Generation Z and how the schools can uh, keep up with that. So let's start. So let me, I want this out of the way. Sorry, folks. What the future wants of Gen Z. So what do employers want from the workforce that will soon be absorbing Generation Z? This is going to be one of the main questions that we look at today. Further, what can colleges do to remain relevant? Um, I think we're finding that uh, the workforce today is going to be very, very different. And the expectations of how one travels from high school to that workforce, again, is, is very, very different. So two members of the Department of Accounting at Southeast Missouri State University, Dana Schweiger and Christine Ladwig, uh, set out to do some culling of research to try to answer these questions. And their findings, based on a large amount of research, which was done by a whole lot of groups, which I'll tell you about, uh, was published under the title of Reaching and Retaining the Next Generation, Adapting to the Expectations of Gen Z in the Classroom. Uh, we're going to give you the link to this actual paper, which will get a lot more elaborate, and you can really research it for yourself at the um, end of the session today when you receive the email. This was published in the Information Systems Education Journal not that long ago in June of 2018. So this is actually pretty new research. So what is this research? Uh, the research that Schweiger and Ladwig drew on was diverse, meaning it drew on a lot of uh, corporations, schools, think tanks, all sorts of stuff. Um, some of those studies were done by Adobe, which I use, Deep Focus, Monster Worldwide Incorporated, otherwise known as Monster, where you post your resume, Ernst & Young, Northeastern University, a um, actual university study, Center for Generational Kinetics, and a whole lot more. So what follows here is the findings of these different researches and uh, how education can be shaped around a series of characteristics. So what we're going to look at are, I think, roughly around 17 or 18 characteristics that kind of define Generation Z. And I'm going to say up front that a lot of them are going to overlap. So you're going to see these kind of uh, themes being repeated throughout. So let's take a look at some of the characteristics. The first one, of course, is that Gen Z is creative. My daughter is totally creative. Um, she loves the game Minecraft. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that game by now. I kind of thought it as a kind of a joke until I started playing it with her. She loves playing this game with me and she is brilliant when it comes to Minecraft. It's a building game. I had another parent tell me about Roblox um, in which kids design their own games. I didn't design my own games on the Atari, but the kids can do this now. This is the way the technology is and you're going to see this technology question come up again and again today. So Adobe did a study and they found that, quote, Gen Z students see technology and creativity as important and intersecting aspects 
of their identities. See, my daughter um, really finds an identity in Minecraft. And in fact, the person, the character that she plays is really a kind of avatar for herself. And this is just a metaphor for uh, what they're doing. When you get into things like the YouTubers, which my daughter will constantly talk about, as do all of her peers who are now in fifth grade. Again, this is kind of uh, the latter stage of Gen Z, who in only a few years will be applying to your schools. Um, this is really how they connect to technology. They see themselves as part of it. This technology is going to set Gen Z apart in the workforce. Well, from who? Well, from the millennials, for one. When the millennials were born, there were things like VCRs and Atari players, you know, and maybe if they were five years old or so, they got to play with a Nintendo. Um, but they didn't have cell phones, and they most definitely did not have the internet. Gen X didn't have any of this stuff. Gen Z, from the day they were born, they've had the internet, they've had search engines, they've had uh, cell phones, handheld computers. Um, they're used to this, this is their life. Gen Z furthermore learns best by doing and creating. And if the doing is creating, well, kudos for them and kudos for you if you have a program that allows them to do that. Students and teachers alike in uh, numerous surveys point out that they want a more of a focus on creativity. So as I've done a lot of work for universities and colleges here, this is where the internship program comes in, in part, but there's a lot of other programs that come in as well. So creativity. Second uh, characteristic is that they are entrepreneurial. Uh, no surprise there. Ernst & Young did a study and they suggest that being self-educated and self-sufficient, two plus two equals the leading of Gen Z to the entrepreneurial spirit. I'll do it myself. Now I've written about this before and it's uh, worth saying. If there's one thing about the millennials that I've often admired, um, it's that they are completely entrepreneurial. And in my neighborhood, I have a lot of small businesses that are being led in, well, a lot of times by millennials. Um, they started their own businesses. They didn't go work for UPS or the airport. So Gen Z has also, like my daughter, grown up in an atmosphere of these small businesses. This is what they see. They see people who are just a little bit older than them who can do this, and they want to do it too. Um, being self-educated, as we're going to see, is really because of the internet. Being self-sufficient, same thing. They've always had access to search engines, and there you go. These kids learn on demand, just like my daughter does. Um, and in fact, I've learned a lot from Gen Z. If I wanna learn anything about my particular study, which is photography, man, I just go to YouTube. I go to any number of websites. I go to Facebook. There's group after group after group who can tell me the answers, sometimes within minutes. Why go to college and get in debt? Well, I can just look stuff up online. And the kids can too. Uh, George Beale in the Huffington Post, we'll mention him numerous times, says that Gen Z wants, quote, more independent work environments. So their desire has much to do with how they viewed the recession of 2008. And the people who went through 2008 were people like me. So all the Gen Xers out there can, you know, give me a high five or whatever for surviving that. And our kids in a lot of ways saw us go through that and they saw literally how we suffered because a lot of us lost jobs. A lot of us are working for companies that cut back. Well, these kids don't want that and they're wary of that. And they're far more wary of that, I think, than the millennials. Some people have pointed that out. So they want a work environment where they're going to be able to do what they want and have flexibility so that they don't have to experience a crash themselves. So speaking of the workforce, uh, the next um, characteristic is fairness. So I've talked about in the past uh, fairness being just in one way, simply that Gen Z um, sees equity as something real, gender equity, equity and sexuality racial equity, on and on and on. These kids have no time for racist and sexist jokes. Okay, they're being raised in a culture where this news is presented to them constantly. So Ernst & Young found the Gen Z values in relation to the workforce, employers that provide equal opportunity for pay and promotion. They wanna be treated simply fairly. Um, a lot of this too comes from surveys of kids when you go and look at this research yourself. Gen Z wants future employers that treat people with respect. As you can see, right? Gender equity, racial equity, behaves ethically, compensates, promotes fairly, and is open and transparent and makes wise business decisions. I mean, this is the culture that they're really um, thriving in. And I think this is a culture that I, I hope, I think a lot of us hope that we're gonna see grow over the course of their lives. 
So another characteristic is these kids are goal oriented. So the Center for Generational Kinetics said the Gen Z wants, quote, to make a decent living working for a stable employer, and they have already started making plans for the future. These kids, when they're exposed to um, the internet constantly, and I really think about this, um, the founder of TheOnion.com, who I've been reading his book, uh, what was his name? Um, anyway, he wrote this book called Outrageous Marketing. And he was talking about how, and he's just about five years, I believe, older than I am. So he's born about the mid 60s. And he said, you know, being in a small town in the upper Midwest, it's hard to do research to find out the kind of things you could do in your life because they didn't have the internet back then. Well, these kids got it. And that's really leading them to be goal oriented because they have the goals uh, pretty much in place right before them. So they're already making plans for their future and they have been probably for years. My daughter wants to be a YouTuber. She's not the only one. And the reason she wants to be that is because the people she admires are YouTubers, especially in relation to the game Minecraft. Uh, David and Jonas Stillman wrote a book in 2017, not too long ago. It's called Gen Z at Work. And they found that more than half of Gen Z wants to write their own job description. Now, again, this kind of is to me seems kind of stunning. So this is a form of personal customization that they're used to. Why? Because they have social media, man. And my daughter is making her own avatar uh, figure. They want to create themselves. Um, there's a wonderful movie that uh, came out recently about Bob Dylan. Um, was by Martin Scorsese, and it was about his 1976 tour. But anyway, Bob Dylan said this thing. It sticks with me. He says, life is not about uh, finding yourself. He said, life is about inventing yourself. And that's what exactly what these kids are doing. They are literally inventing themselves. And in that invention, they want to invent their own job description. Gen Z is willing, too, to start at the bottom of a company and work their way up. So uh, this is part of something that gets attributed to Gen Z a lot, which is that they're realistic. They are realists. And a lot of that, again, is because of their parents, the Gen Xers, who went through hard times and became much more realistic because of it. So continuing on. What can you do? There's that magic word, volunteer. Hands-on experiences. Offer those to the kids. The high schools are being to catch on to this too, of course. Adobe found that 78% of students, as well as 77% of teachers, felt Gen Z learns best by hands-on experiences. Well, as Benjamin Franklin has said, you know, in one way or another, we all do, right? Teach a man to fish and he will feed himself forever. That's what the kids want. They just want to be told how to do it. And YouTube will tell them how to do it. Um, YouTube has told me how to, uh, you know, fix my faucet, which was I was very grateful for. And it, I can pretty much do all my home repairs by watching videos. It's wonderful. 60% um, of teachers incorporated more hands-on learning in their classrooms. And 52% wants to, quote, evolve the teaching curriculum. And I think this has to do uh, largely with high school, but it probably falls into the category of colleges too. Um, we see in the public schools, I think we're starting to see a move toward giving the kids more opportunity to just do it themselves. Whoop. A point that comes up in other studies too is that Gen Z does not feel prepared for the real world, which is to say their future. Um, this is a very anxious uh, generation. Uh, there's been a lot of mental health studies of Gen Z, and there's there's plenty of reasons, as you can understand, why they're nervous. And we've seen this before in terms of things like uh, everything from school shootings. And I mean that quite literally. You know, a lot of the kids are on edge. They see a world that's um, having a tough time with the climate and plenty else. So they want to fix it. Uh, which brings us to the point that these kids have high expectations. Uh, note our young man over here with his credit card. I love that. Because um, this will have to do with shopping a little bit, which is what kids are doing when it comes to school. They're shopping. So according to Ernst & Young, Gen Z expects their shopping experiences to be, quote, intuitive, seamless, and error-free. Um, there was a time when Amazon wasn't quite getting it right. They were recommending books to me that uh, weren't things I necessarily wanted. Um, before we started our webinar, we were just talking about Kroger and how wonderful Kroger, the grocery store chain out here, is. Well, they used to send me coupons for things that I just don't buy. They've got it together. And now their coupons are coming at me in my mail and they are specifically things I want. And it's, I can tell that they're really keeping track of this. They're keeping track of better data. Well, the kids are used to this. Gen Z will provide personal data, like I'm talking about when I give to Kroger every time I go through their shopping line, provided that they receive a valuable personalized experience in return. 
So going back to Kroger, I mean, part of that personalized experience is really them sending me things that I actually need. Um, they want engagement that builds into ongoing relationships. Now, I think about colleges in this term quite a bit. Um, and I'll talk about that a little more when it comes to some of these experiences like videos. Um, recently, I was made aware of a Yale University video, and I think there's a series of them which have to do with the day in the life of a real student. And this is what the kids want to see. So that's a personalized experience for them, showing them one of their peers actually going through Yale University or any number of universities um, so they can see what it's really like. And the kids have high expectations as to what they perceive that future to be. They have a desire to make things better, like the environment, for example, like equity issues, social justice, so on and so forth. This is not just America. This is, in fact, worldwide. So multitasking, that's, that's pretty much my kid. Um, I love the young man here. He's got the kind of tripod I want. My daughter knows how to do exactly what he's doing, which is making videos. And at the same time, she could be reading a book and probably making a sandwich. Um, George Beale reported that Gen Z lives in a world of continuous updates. And it's their experience too that's, that's being updated. The technology is constantly changing. Schools are constantly changing. The news is constantly changing. And they adapt rather rapidly. Um, it has been, said that, of course, and I've mentioned this before, that Gen Z has a um, attention span of, if I remember right, six seconds. Well, you can look at that in a derogatory way, you can look at it in a negative way, you can just simply look at it in a positive way. But these kids have an, what's called an attention portfolio, and they know how to invest it correctly. If you can't get their attention in six seconds, they move on. And the more positive uh, look at that is, is showing exactly that. We have to get their attention pretty quick or else they're just not interested. So here we go. Though this could mean a shorter attention span, it can also denote a strong ability to multitask. Uh, technology shapes our brains, and it's going so fast that these uh, younger people are really adapting to it, having to adapt to it in a much quicker way. Um, so continuing on, personalized micro experiences. We kind of mentioned this a little bit when we're talking about shopping. Uh, that kid's doing what I do, by the way. He's, I'm sure he's looking up how to play a song on his guitar on the computer. I do it on my phone, which makes it kind of clunky, but it can be done. Um, Ernst & Young found that Gen Z desires more personalized micro experiences. And this has much to do with online shopping as the ease and efficiency such shopping provides. And that includes college websites. Um, the easier it is for them to navigate, and the more micro experiences that might offer, whether it be a video, um, a funny video for even two minutes um, showing the lives of students, they really appreciate that. They expect that. These concepts, uh, SMSU points out, that's uh, Southern Missouri State University, also apply to the consumption of educational resources. And these educational resources are not just the ones you provide, they're the ones that Google is gonna provide on the job. So those micro experiences in their education are valuable as well. Gen Z, according to the author Merriman, says anything is possible. They expect their online experiences to be convenient, intuitive, error-free, and seamless. Nobody, not me or you, wants to have an online experience where we're trying to buy something and the whole system goes clunk. Kids have no patience for that. They've been looking at these things their whole life and they've learned how to be faster, faster even than myself, I'm sure. So here's a great word and a great philosophy, which is pragmatism. Um, the kids are pragmatic. They're looking at things in a realistic fashion. So the Cassandra Report, which was only in 2015 and was based on surveys of nearly 1,000 Gen Z kids, found that these kids know life will not be easy. Um, they're not idealistic per se, and or even optimistic as I think the Gen Xers were. And, of course, that led to a major disappointment in about 2008 or so. Well, the kids are looking at things very different. So that 71% said they are likely to experience significant failure before success. And 40% view failure as, and this is probably a good number, an opportunity to try again. The kids are learning that failing is not bad. Um, Stephen Dicker, I think that was his name, the guy who founded The Onion, but he wrote, Scott, Scott Dicker. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Um, he wrote about failure as well. And uh, theonion.com, they tried everything in the book, learned from their mistakes, 
And that's what made the whole thing better. It's the same thing with any art, like photography. I make a mistake, I learn what that means, I move on, I try it again. Remember, Gen Z's parents weathered the Great Recession in 2008. That's their big model. So self-informed, meaning these kids know how to learn themselves. Beale reports that students lean toward learning what they want to know on their own. My daughter is definitely like this. And really, I guess I'm definitely like this. And I try to model that offer. Um, the internet allows for this. Uh, they can explore anything they want in real time. They don't have to wait for the school to tell them. Therefore, as Ernst & Young found, this generation is essentially self-educated and self-sufficient. And for the older kids who are now applying to schools, if they're applying to schools in high school, um, they know how to learn. And they know how to learn on their own terms. This generation, quote, grew up having access to search engines and the habit of finding information for themselves. My daughter definitely knows how to do this. And the iPad I gave her is clunked up with about a million different search engines open to the things she's looking for, whether it's Pokemon figures or whatever it may be. Uh, CGK points out that Gen Z is adept at using web-based resources for research, of course. Um, for those of us who had to learn the library, you know, you can still do that. I still do that somewhat, but we don't use card catalogs. I look for any of my library materials in the comfort of my kitchen, and then I can just go get them or just have them delivered, you know. Um, they place a priority on how fast they can find the right information rather than on actually knowing the right information. That's a heavy statement. I'll let you sort that out for yourselves as to what that might mean. But speed is everything. Okay, self-reliant, one of my favorite terms. Again, these kids can take care of themselves. Ernst & Young says that Gen Z relies on self-service tools to do research rather than interacting with an expert. Sure, they can go down and ask a librarian. Sure, they can ask their teacher. But at home, they can pick up any device and find it in seconds. That makes them incredibly self-reliant and they want to remain that way. So remember, when they say they want to write their own job description, here's why. Gen Z, according to Beale, are early starters. They're predicted to jump from high school straight into the workforce. And I've written about this, and this is a whole nother can of worms. Their independence, he suggests, makes online learning more credible for them. First of all, uh, corporations like Microsoft and Google offer credentialing. They offer education within the companies themselves. The kids don't need to go to college, and they know this. So a lot of um, our high school students are going to jump directly into their jobs, and they're going to get their credentials from those jobs. So again, this webinar is going to point toward what you can do to kind of aid this and be a part of this. But this independence and being able to learn on their own on the job is going to make them really want to do that, self-reliant. So Monster, where you post your resume, found that 76% of Gen Z has an entrepreneurial focus. We've said this numerous times today, envisioning themselves as driving their own careers and advancement. Okay, if they want to be a YouTuber, they can do it. And I think they can see the route. So skill focused, skills are everything. Remember, hands-on, internships, volunteering. According to the Cassandra report, Gen Zers realize the importance of building skills at a young age. I think they're getting taught this in school and I think they just really, they see it online. Um, they see it in their uh, role models. 89% of Gen Z use their free time for productive and creative things, not like I did, for just hanging out. Drug use is a fallen in Gen Z. Um, teen pregnancies are a fallen. All these things are falling off. These kids are active now, and it's going to be a very different generation. 62% um, therefore want to be entrepreneurs rather than working for an established business. My father taught me to go get a job. I'm not telling my daughter that. I, in fact, tell my daughter to make a job. Honestly, you know, I mean, because there's just so many roots for her, and I look at her and I see what her skills are. I see what her talents are. And I tell her, just do it for yourself. So 58% of those kids, after listening to dads like me, are developing their own skills in business. 51% are doing that in graphic arts. Think how much, you know, Google needs this. Facebook needs this. Anything needs this. 50% in video production, uh, just like my daughter did this summer. She took a two-week course on how to make movies and uh, how to make um, webcasts. Incredible, two weeks. And 50% are actually um, looking at app development. That's something I think I've really pushed my daughter towards since she loves all these games. Design your own, I say, and that's what Roblox does that kids are growing up with. 
Uh, good old social media. Um, I use Instagram and Facebook, but that's for old people. Um, they have their own kind of scene, you know, but their experience with social media, which I, I point out, I think in a little bit includes YouTube may lead Gen Z to be, as the Cassandra report says, interested in narratives and content using real people with realistic themes. Okay, a lot of these YouTubers, these are not paid actors. These are just regular kids or 20-somethings like themselves. And there's a lot of teenage Gen Zers who have these pages. They're real. And the story they tell is what attracts any of us, right? We all are interested in narratives and stories. Well, this is really what social media revolves around. So think about it. Again, a day in the life of a Yale University student. That's how this comes in. It's not an actor and it's not just a, a photo that you download from you know, some service like Getty. These are real people and that's what the kids wanna see. So these kids may also want to keep social media separate. Um, Cassandra found, and this is interesting, that Gen Z prefers that the brands they like communicate through YouTube and not other social media sites, right? And YouTube is social media. Ads on YouTube are okay. Ads on Facebook, apparently, say the kids, they don't want it. I don't really want it. I don't want ads on my Instagram, um, but I see them. And sometimes they're helpful, but lots of times they're not, you know. Um, the kids get weary of that real quick. So storytelling, and that's what that's what they do. My daughter loves to read. She loves stories. Um, if you have a kid who, even if they're teenagers now, even if they're young millennials, they probably read Harry Potter, okay? And these kids identify with that. In fact, I found a whole study online um, that looked worldwide at how people identify with Harry Potter. It's, it's true. Um, this is how it is for kids. So Ernst & Young reflects on immersive storytelling where media companies collaborate with tech companies to integrate programming with what's called the Internet of Things devices. So if you don't know, and I didn't really know, we just talked about this before, and Alicia helped me out um, with a quick, quick search. Um, the Internet of Things apparently just simply refers to the fact that everything is interconnected on the Internet itself. Your phone is connected to the Internet, your iPad, your computer, and further, my iPad is connected to my computer. So this whole web, is the internet and it's all telling stories and the tech companies are working to integrate that across all of your devices okay and at capture higher ed we're really trying to do that too in other words if we send out an email with a student story we make sure that it will appear the same or you know fully on the computer as well as their phone Gen Z values storytelling, of course, and so the integration of their Internet of Things devices allows for that to go to a deeper level. They can hold it in their hand. My daughter loves the iPad I bought for her. I still call it mine, but it's really kind of hers. Again, reflect on how social media, which again, you can look at on any device, and Gen Z's incredible skills with technology, note the YouTubers, makes that a part of their lives. These kids carry stories in the palm of their hand. And it's not just a book like the young lady next to us. It's also, as my daughter uses um, the program Libby, so she can um, download books straight onto the iPad from the library. Trust. Now we talked about businesses earlier um, and the fact that the kids want to be able to trust them. Ernst & Young found that 18% of US Gen Z respondents thought that their caretakers work experience, parents, the Gen X generation that went through 2008, had a very or somewhat negative impact on the trust that they themselves would place in a future employer. Or to say it simply, you laid off my dad, I don't trust you, and that you is corporations in general. Hence, I'm gonna start my own business. I'm gonna be a YouTuber. And you gotta understand that for kids, this is not unrealistic. And really for me, it's not unrealistic either. I think the economy is changing rapidly. And this internet of things is going to be where the new economy actually lands. And I wanna say, I just came to that awareness right about now. And I kind of stuffed myself there for a minute. I thought, yeah, that's really the way it is, isn't it? And it is. That's the way it's gonna be for my daughter. She's gonna work on her iPhone. The movies that she made in her um, camp were made on these really nice, big, full-size iPads that connected to the projector so that they could show the movies to all the parents who were sitting in those folding chairs. Pretty incredible. Factors Gen Z noted included poor quality of raises, 
Yeah. A dislike of job or a dislike or distrust of the boss, colleagues, or top level executives. Why should I work for you? Well, you know, there's a lot of answers for that. Again, I want to design as a Gen Zer my own job description, which brings us to workplace advancement. This is the final characteristic. If Gen Z is going to work for employers at all, they want an opportunity for promotion. Ernst and Young found that out. They want to, as CGK found, to make a decent living working for a stable employer. They want to know that their job's not going to be lost. Okay, so now we'll go to the next part. What do colleges need to do in order to, well, keep up pace with the Internet of Things, with the world of social media, with an entirely different economy that's just going to continue evolving? Well, Northeastern University did a study on this in 2014 to find out. And we've updated probably a little since then, but a lot of what they found is very valuable. So, first of all, Gen Z are self-starters who want to design their own programs of study in college. And you've seen this, okay, throughout the whole of today's program. Gen Z is certain about the importance of higher education to achieve their goals, okay? They still know that college is good, but they really want that college, I think, to be on their own terms. But that credential is important to them. In fact, there's been studies on credentialing with Gen Z that show that credentialing is incredibly important to them. They just see a wider range of credentials than just a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. Gen Z is concerned about the cost of college and student loan debt and how that will affect their future. Well, no surprise there. Gen Z believes colleges should offer some form of professional experience like internships. So I agree. Couldn't agree more. And finally, 52% of Gen Z believes that an online degree would be accepted the same as a traditional one. So I think we're going to see a lot more kids wanting to do an online degree because they can do it on their own time. Well, we make that time for adults who have kids and, uh, you know, jobs and or even working in the military, as I found when I taught um, down Fort Knox. But uh, I think the kids are now going to be quickly adapting to that, too. They want the same thing. So what do employers want? Well, they actually want technical and soft skills. Now, here's a chart that you'll find in the um, uh, the link that we send you. And just looking at these 70% range, most of them are soft skills. Okay, so this is graduate skills preferences, ability to work in a team, problem solving skills, communication skills, strong work ethic, communication skills, written and verbal, leadership. Okay, as we fall down, all of these are soft skills. We don't really get down to technical skills here. Well, until we get down to technical skills at 56.8%, and then you see things like computer skills, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, but a lot of these are, are really skills that denote who the kids are as people, and it's how they work with others that's going to be increasingly important. So here's the proposition that Northeastern University sets up, and it's called the IPO model. So the SMSU authors who we're basing this on suggest an educational model that aligns the characteristics of Gen Z with the expectations of employers to make what they call a skills-based infrastructure model. One second, your PowerPoint is no longer showing. If you could. Oh, what happened? Send, I'm going to uh, hop over real quick. I'm gonna take control and I will forward your slides from there if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Give me one second. Oh, just hold on just a moment. We're having some technical difficulties. So sorry about that. We didn't know we slipped. Someone in the office came in and told us. Are you sharing my screen? I have got mine right now. Okay. Are we using your screen now? Mm -hmm. Hey, we're on it. Okay, so what do employees want? Well, there they are. Um, technical and soft skills. Again, if you missed this chart, if we didn't get it in time, um, it is going to be available to you after we um, complete this. So the proposition IPO model, again, is a skills-based infrastructure model that schools can incorporate. 
So again, looking real quick at the top, the characteristics of Gen Z, a lot of soft skills, technically or not so much technically oriented, but experiential, um, pragmatic, problem solving, so on and so forth, along with uh, technically oriented and so on and so forth, get added to the educational mission and the two plus two equals four, okay? How do we process that? Well, we work on the kids' experiential learning. We give them the technical abilities. We teach them communication, written and oral, so that the employers get what it is they want, strong work ethics, strategic planning, knowledge, initiative, and so on and so forth. The colleges are the intermediary in this to giving the employers what they want. And IPO stands for Input Processing Output. So how do you attract and retain students? That's you. One, use storytelling via student video stories on your website. Day in the life, Yale student. Lots of examples. Uh, my favorite is the University of, of the Cumberlands video, which you can find, I believe you should be able to find in their blog. And I've written about it. It's, it's a wonderful thing and it works. Two, get Gen Z's attention in high school. Um, give Gen Z the peer-based information, hands-on experience, and stories by giving them the opportunity to interact with current students. Again, a day in the life is um, through YouTube, which they're used to, and this can also go well for you know, um, school visits and whatnot. Develop a freshman course, number three, to introduce students to computer science and app development. That's what they want. And by the time you get to college, a lot of them have had computer courses anyway, but it's just taking it to the next level. Number four, create new minors and certificate programs to align with Gen Z's interests. These certificate programs are kind of essentially what Google is going to be offering them. You can offer them as well. Number five is involve employers in curriculum development. Now, this may have some controversy attached to it, but you can see how you can involve employers as many colleges do through internships. You can see probably how you can involve employers in actively doing classroom projects for those employers, but you can also invite the employers on advisory boards where they can have their say, this is what our corporation needs, this is what our city needs, this is what the economy needs. And the final one is develop career development strategies to engage and retain students. For example, Provide experiential learning opportunities. We've said this a lot of times to encourage technical and soft skills through internships, group projects, corporate guest speakers, competitions, uh, volunteering, all sorts of things. Offer online or blended courses, as well as certifications that encourage students to learn on their own. Okay, give them the time and they will most definitely do it. Offer short run classes, okay, concentrated programs, not term long. The kids want to know what they want to know right now. Um, boot camps, something lasts maybe a week to add to a student's portfolio. My daughter um, in her elementary school has this little thing called a backpack. It's not something she carries on her back, something that's carried on the school server. And the backpack is a portfolio that she must defend, no kidding, at the end of fifth grade. This is what the kids are used to now. Imagine what it's gonna be like when she's in high school. The kids in high school are already doing portfolios. This is what's valued. You can help them do it. And finally, assess and modify by getting feedback from all the stakeholders, colleges, the employers, and of course, Gen Z. So all the material here is going to be um, in the article, there's the link, and you will be sent this link in an email um, once we're done. Um, and the references um, will all be listed there as well, all titles, all the links for all the works cited. And that, I believe, ends my portion. So now I'll pass it over to Alicia. And thank yeah. you for your patience. Thank you, Sean. Do you want to pull up your screen over here? How do I do that? Ah. One second, please. All right. So now we're going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attending <coughs> control panel. Uh, let's see. 
we have some thank yous for pausing to work the PowerPoint. So yeah. props to that. Uh, let's see the first one that we have. Um, it says there are a lot of characteristics that you have noted in your presentation. Are there any that stand out that would be most important to try to connect and help retain Gen Z students? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to think about my daughter who, uh, we'll just keep this between all of us. Um, my daughter is rather impatient with school and I don't, you know, I really don't blame her. Um, we're still kind of going through the, uh, testing phase of American education. Um, she's not interested. Some kids are, and they can work well in that system. Mine can't. And my daughter is in no way exceptional or exemplary. Um, I think that the more schools can offer the material and the information in a simply a faster way, which really means let them do it on their own at their own pace, I think they're just going to be happy. Um, I would be happy doing that. Okay, and I've said this in, I believe, in the last uh, webinar, but this seems to me really important is when the kids think of time today, an 18 year old. Again, I can go online, I can go to Google, I can go to Google's uh, corporate headquarters and learn what I need to learn quickly. But if you're asking me to sit in a college for four years, why should I do that? Um, and this is really I, what the kids are really saying. And this is what the research is finding is, is we don't have the time. And I think this is what's leading um, to kids going directly from the school to the workforce is just, I don't have the time. Um, I'm going to get that credential, but it's just not going to be from you. So uh, some of um, what's talked about here at the end of today's program, which again is in that article, we'll break this down even a little bit further and uh, with a little more detail and how you can design a program to uh, allow the kids to do that. It would be a lot like adult ed and just we're thinking of the 18 year olds as adults now. Um, and I think maybe the second thing that it really it just um, as one more is really that technology. I mean, you know, I see all the kids my daughter's age. I've watched them grow up. Um, I have uh, still cousins, nephews, nieces who are now teenagers. Um, they always got a phone in their hand, man. And uh, the, the phone, the computer, the iPads, uh, YouTube, uh, Netflix, this is their life. They've seen it the whole experience you know and their parents do it so everything is, is readily accessible to them so the more you're an online presence the, the easier they're going to find you um, and when we send emails to the kids those links need to work and they need to go somewhere that's going to present the kids that micro experience they're used to having i think those are the two biggest things i see but i think all these characteristics and then are, are again bouncing off each other sure uh let's see we've got one more which i think kind of relates to the second half of your answer which is how does using Capture Higher Ed help with retaining Gen Z? How does using Capture Higher Ed? Well, I can tell you that um, in, in my department, and just strictly speaking in my department, which is operations, which is we are the people who are writing the content. Um, we have been studying Gen Z for years and all of the material we put out including those social media ads um this is based on what gen z wants so i'm the senior content writer here and there's uh two content writers who i work with train kind of mentor in a way at the very least we talk about this stuff internally in the company i've written oh, everything from books about gen z to white papers about gen z blogs about gen z trying to nail down how can we reach these kids on the level they want to be reached at um, again that university of the cumberland's video which is quite amazing that was something that not that we made but it's something that we utilized and we really made a big hoo-ha about it. And I believe if I remember right, we simply sent out an email because we can do this and uh, you should know we can do this is we send out emails with links to YouTube or just links to videos, period. Um, in the long run, you know, I'd love to see us working more with video, um, but as kind of problem solvers and advisors too, you know, I, I couldn't advise you more about making videos. I know there's an expense to it, but boy, it works. Social media, you know, some kids are on Facebook and we do use that, but we're also reaching the parents and um, Instagram as well. We do those ads and they're really meant to be 
kind of short, sharp, shocked, kind of reach the kids and they just naturally fall into those uh, posts that they naturally see. They can like them, they can, you know, share them and so on and so forth. And we find kind of that um, they do. The most successful ones actually get a break. And the kids really are doing this. So again, across the board, you know, we study this stuff every month. Uh, are our emails working? Yeah, for sure. Are the uh, social media ads working? Yeah, for sure, you know. And if they are falling a little short, we work on them, and we work on them on research. So that's our big input right now is, is really studying Gen Z and shaping all of our communication efforts around what it is they want. Yeah, great. All right. Well, thank you. It looks like that's going to be the end of the Q&A section of today's presentation. So thank you, Sean, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. If you have any other questions, I'm going to send you a follow-up email within 48 hours that you can respond to. Um, and on behalf of Sean and myself and Capture Higher Ed, thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.